All right, we are live. Hello, everybody. And somebody asked a great question. So, Simon, do you know Dave Tran <laughs> at Guitar Zero to Hero? Do you know no, Dave? No, I do not, do not know Dave. I do not know Dave at all. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thanks so much for tuning in. Morning. Uh, well, you know, morning for me. Uh, I'm in Sydney, Australia, so hence the morning. Did you know that the um, that the Earth actually revolves around New York? <laughs> what? No, we're talking about just. I thought it revolved around me. <laughs> He's actually in New, in New York. So I will, let me give a shout out to Dave from uh, from uh, Guitar Here to Zero. So he's got a huge following, right? Uh, well over a million viewers, I believe, on his right. channel. And awesome. he, and I'm sure he's got a. Uh, I hope he has an assistant. I can just imagine the volume of emails and stuff he gets, but he actually answered us personally. Um, wow. and, and, and uh, I think he called on the phone too. He didn't speak to me. He spoke to my, my partner, but uh, yeah, he actually was the only U big time. Uh, Jerry says 1.5 million. So wow. but, uh, it's, it's good that he's still on the front lines. It's out. hard. I'll tell you, it's hard with 45,000 to keep up. I mean, I get like <laughs> 35 email. I get 35 to 40 emails a day. All right. So today, those of you that are on today are on for a treat. So this is Gabe again. You guys, uh, Gabe, I went to high school with. Gabe is actually in New York. He's uh, where are you on Second Ave? Oh no, you're in you're in Brooklyn Heights, right? No, I'm in Jackson Heights. You're in, in Jackson uh, Heights in, in, Queens. in Queens, home of the New York Mets. Go Mets! Yeah, yeah, that's about uh, that's about half a mile from here. I've never been to City Field. I move. Hey, uh, T, um, Yellow Cat. We got all the all the regulars on Sandra and Blake. Thank you all for coming on tonight. And uh, we have 20 people on tonight, so let's let's try to keep this entertaining. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about how to stay engaged and i think that i know that a lot of the people that follow my channel are in that weird situation where they're you know they love the guitar you know they've kind of had a relationship with it for the past 20 30 years and they know 20 or 30 songs and every time they pick it up you know they go back and play the same five songs and just feel like they're in this this endless cycle of the same songs and not motivated uh, when they solo, I'm just, I'm, it's funny that I'm like stereotyping all of my viewers here, but, um, you know, soloing using that minor pentatonic one. So, so Simon, let's, why don't you kick us off? Tell us. Um, yeah, sure. I think, here. yeah. So I think the first thing, you know, um, so I predominantly teach people between 30 and 75. And I would say that the most important thing is just to be patient with yourself. I know it seems like, especially with all the people playing on YouTube and stuff, you just look at them and they're just amazing. And it looks like they've done it in about, you know, learned it in 10 minutes. I absolutely promise you that is not the case. I think you just got to be a little bit patient with yourself and, and be kind to yourself when you're doing it. I think that's possibly the most important thing out of everything. Because yeah. it's hard, right? Yeah. And, you know, you're talking about being patient. So we're going to... Um... I'm going to talk about that. So patient can mean several things, but one of the things is we'll go back to this. I want to get into soloing for a second. I know I'm probably getting ahead of, I haven't looked at some of the, Simon wrote out a nice little, um, <laughs> I was prepared that, I, that, that, uh, I actually put into the, into the system here, but I didn't actually read it. So, um, I will be, um, I'm as excited as you guys are to find out what I can do to stay engaged. But I know that a lot of people that solo end up doing this kind of thing. So I got, I actually have a backing track here tonight. Oh, in the future. And they run up and down scales, right? You know? The problem is people think that you have to play too many notes. There's too many notes there. You can literally play one note over this progression. And I think that part of being patient and being kind to yourself is just playing one or two notes and enjoying that. The most important thing whenever you play is to be intentional. If you don't know what the note sounds like that you're about to play, then you shouldn't play it. I know a lot of you, you know, don't know the fretboard and, and have no idea when you go to that. You know that the this is in a um, you can play a, what do you call it? G sharp minor pentatonic over this, but um, something like this. that over and over right oh 
a lot of tune there, but just try try to play something uh, over and over again and just get used to it and really try to internalize what it sounds like. What do those notes sound like? So the next time you pick up the guitar, you'll have a better idea and you'll be surprised how quickly you will start to get to recognize what the notes sound like. And even if you uh, aren't sure, you'll have a familiarity so that when you go back to your minor pentatonic scale, you'll know at least if you go like this. You know, resolving on that on that root note, right, Simon? Yeah, that's right. I think the, uh, yeah, so I mean, like in that situation, just practicing having a sort of, you know, things that you practice, because the more times you practice the, whatever it is, well, you're playing in A flat, right? So, you know, those sorts of things, and things like concentrating on actually what you're doing, instead of just trying to do it as fast as you can, you know, just try to think about how hard you're pressing, because the lighter you press, the quicker you'll be able to play over time. Things like that. And, and just you, you know, so practice scale. I mean, you don't need to practice scales over and over again. You should be familiar with the scales, but practice fragments of the scales or practice. You know, there, here's a good exercise: do something, at least break it up. Something like uh, you know, yeah. break it up into yeah. um, into sixes or you know, triplet form that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, th threes are awesome because that that's something that you practice and then can just come out and it's great. Right? That so, you know, that, that's actually right. that kind of thing. That, yeah, that is true. That is true. So that's the first thing I would say. Definitely be patient. Try and be patient. I know it can be frustrating. I totally understand. Um, but, uh, you know, I think sort of manage your expectations, you know. Hello from Oregon. Uh, yeah, now, now. On, that, on the note, you said manage your expectations. So one of the things about that is um, you definitely, the one thing that I see, oh, now I've got two banners at once here. How do I get rid of the first oh, banner? Let's I don't know. That's, that, I think you've go. got a ticket. There you go. Hold on. No, oh, no, no. But we chopped out Gabe. That's no hold good. On, hold on. Here we go. We're going to get rid of that. And now we're going to show that. Look at that, huh? Oh, no. Oh. Wrong one. I almost had it. There oh, it so good. I don't know why. Uh, I, I got to move Gabe around a little bit here, though. Yeah. So I'll, I'll chop me off instead. Yeah. The next thing I think is really just to, you don't have to go and spend a million dollars, but if you've got a guitar that's hard to play, it's going to be hard. <laughs> I, I have lots of people, oh, well, historically, I used to, when I used to teach kids, um, their mums and dads would send them to lessons for me, with me. And they'd send them with like a nylon string guitar or an acoustic guitar that the strings were like literally this far off the fretboard. And it's like nobody can play that thing. And so you're giving this young person, they might be 9, 10, 11, 12, this guitar, but they're paying almost the value of the guitar for the lesson, which was crazy, um, and expecting them to be able to play the guitar. And, and then when I would suggest, hey, look, you know, like he's really having or she's really, really having a good go at it, it's probably worth spending, you know, three or four hundred bucks on this, whatever. It was often met with reticence. And I think that's a real shame because if you've got something easy to play or easier to play, you're going to be successful at it. I totally think that's a thing. A hundred percent. And parents out there, the other thing is uh, a buddy of mine wanted to get a guitar for his son. His son was, you know, 13 spending all day in his room playing uh video games and speaking of sons i the kids are up, i hear the dogs upstairs i told them to try to be quiet but they don't listen they're 13 anyway so we got him a guitar and i said get him a guitar that's pretty good because at least if he doesn't take to it you can sell it you know usually if you buy a three or four hundred dollar guitar you can usually get three quarters of its value if you're going to buy like an entry level or a hand-me-down something usually you get nothing back for it so no. Um, you know, you don't want to plan for somebody quitting, but at the same token, it, it is tough. I, I know when we were kids, when I was a kid, you know, I had a, you know, the, the action was ridiculous. I mean, I did, I wanted to quit right away. And yeah. thankfully my father bought me a, um, my father bought me a Telestar. I actually got an electric guitar about a month after I started. It was, it was also That's a piece awesome. of crap, but at least it had better action. And it was an electric guitar. That's pretty electric, exciting. Yeah. yeah. I had a Rickenbacker amp too. It's funny. I like I like companies that make uh, that make guitars for amps. I'm using a, a Gibson amp tonight. I love Gibson. Oh, that's amps. cool. Yeah. 
So. Uh, all right, that's number two. So number right. three, have you put it up? Yep, number three. Oh, that's right. Yeah, this is a good one. So often I have people that come in and they're like, I want to learn, insert classic rock tune here. I want to learn the solo in, I don't know, Sweet Child of Mine or something. And I'm like, okay, well, it's great. We're going to learn a D chord today. <laughs> um, I'm all for ambition. I think it's awesome. I'm going to tell you a story in a second that kind of negates this point a little bit, but I think it was a bit of an unusual situation. I love when people contradict themselves. I do it all the time. Yes, yeah, so, but I mean, generally, uh, as my, my job as your teacher, often I, you know, you say, I'd like to learn this song. And... I go, absolutely, generally I say, we can learn anything you like and I'll just arrange it to make it possible, right? So for example, slight plug, uh, this weekend on my channel, I've got a video on how to play Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen. And I've basically put, I had put it in five levels, but YouTube didn't like that and they, they told me I couldn't upload it. So it had to be three levels, but you can get the five level version at my Patreon, <laughs> patreon.com forward slash Simon Morrell. Um, but the... The, the thing is, is just start off by, you know, two, three, four, five, six, one, two. You can hear the song, right? And then put the right hand in. You know? So have something that's applicable to your level. Yeah, that, that's really important because if you want to talk about getting disillusioned, that's the best way to do it. Uh, it really, another thing kind of combined, we were talking about people, uh, parents especially, that don't want to pay for a, a reasonably good guitar for their kid, but they'll sink thousands of dollars into lessons. That's the other thing, too, is, you know, people on the other side of it, people will pay two, three thousand dollars for a guitar, but they won't want to invest in private lessons. It's, it blows my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm usually I'm usually always jammed up, so I don't even have space. So I've never tried to like, you know. I'm never angling to try to get students, but I, I couldn't stress more to take private lessons if you could afford it at all. I mean, even if you take them every other week, you're going to get so much more out of it. You're going to be accountable. And I see, I know so many people that say, oh, you know, I watched the video for this and that. And I tried to play it. And I spent six, a guy said to me, I spent six hours trying to learn the, uh, beginning to Johnny be good. And I'm like, you know, you wasted yeah. six hours. You could have been, yeah. you could have learned 10 songs that, you would have enjoyed and you would have gotten some some satisfaction out of it so, absolutely. So, so so my contradiction to my story is is this story uh i used to teach this young lad who lived opposite me actually and he was a nice young fella but his dad had sent him here because he played too many video games basically i think australia you mean yes you sent him to australia yes sent him to australia no we, that's a long time ago we don't do that anymore um and uh so he was really keen on learning Sweet Child of Mine, super keen. And I was like, dude, we're just not going to be able to do that straight away. And after about seven or eight weeks of him literally not practicing at all, I just thought, okay, well, look, this is how it goes. And he came back the next week and he'd actually had a really good go at it. But that was the, and then the same week his dad took him to go and see ACDC at a big stadium somewhere and there's Angus Young doing his, uh, you know, thing and uh and that was it that was the fire it was ignited and now he's doing a phd in music in oh that's history. awesome that's that's a great story so I mean, that, that riff isn't isn't too bad right was it yeah but i mean like it's not the first thing i would teach somebody like not first day no definitely no. not yeah but he had a good go at it and uh and then that was a hymn for for life he was sucked into music for life so that was awesome but i would still say generally you know, eruption is not going to be the first thing you're going to learn. Definitely not. The tremolo picking maybe, but not the, uh, you know, learning the tremolo yeah, picking. That's right. like, did you see how that's... Matteo Mancuso does it with, uh, with three fingers? And it's ridiculous. Yeah, but yeah. so one of the things that um, I just lost my train of thought. Shoot. I, I, had, a, I had a really good point and, and I forgot it. It'll come back to you. Let's keep moving. Yeah. Uh, so number four. We've got number four. Oh, you've managed to get the banner back. Oh, you're a genius, mate. Yeah, it's that's fantastic. Cool. So number four is gonna be, drum roll please. Yep. Drum roll is gonna be, it doesn't matter how much you practice, just try and practice a little bit. If you could practice a little bit every single day, that is awesome. 
Um, have a schedule around your practicing. So, you know, like if you've got a job, you'll have a meeting with your boss and your boss is like you're meeting on your bo with your boss at nine o'clock on a Monday morning and you can't really miss that. You can't sort of say, hey man, I just, just can't make that today. <laughs> so your practice should be like that. That is true about your good work with the good tools as well. Anyway, so, but you should definitely have a time set aside for playing the guitar and if you know, you go out for dinner or lunch or whatever, or you're going out having a good time, m make sure you just reschedule it. And even if you can't reschedule it, just do five minutes of something. Five minutes, two minutes, two minutes. You do I agree with you more. Yeah, I, you I, I, just I, I, that for two minutes. I have a student who played, one of my bass students, he's maybe watching this or he'll watch eventually, my, uh, my student Isaac, and he never practices. So I finally got it where he would, he practices five minutes a day and he grinds. I mean, he practices five minutes every day and he, he, it's a slow progress, but he's actually a pretty good bass player. I mean, he's been taking lessons for about two years now, but yeah. uh, he really, um, he just puts in his five minutes and uh, he, oh God. Oh, I know. So somebody asked a question. Uh, Dan asked about modes. So one thing about modes, if you're going to practice modes, um, this is, I know we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but and I'm not sure. Let me put Dan's question back up real quickly here. He said, can we do parallel modes? So one of the things, if you're going to practice modes, you want to practice all the modes in the same position. And what I mean by that is like, if you're playing, um, let's do G major, right? So if you play uh, G major, and then you play, um, you know, A Dorian, then you play B Phrygian, you know, and so on and so forth. All you're doing is playing the G major scale over and over again. You're never going to hear the quality of that mode. If you, you know, you start, it's all G major, right? It's all you're hearing. Now, if you play all the modes in one position, you play the G, um, G major, G Ionian. And you play the G Dorian. And you play the G Phrygian. Then you play the you know Lydian. You hear that raise four. Peter Frampton loves that, right? So that's definitely the way to practice the modes. And because and I this I know this from I actually was a victim of this. For years, the first teacher, the only real teacher I had, said, oh, the modes are, he explained it to me. So, you know, over a G chord, you know, I played um, a Dorian, right? Right, that's going to be, no matter what, over a G chord, you're never going to be able to make that sound like a Dorian, it, it, you know? The, um, the, in that case, the harmonic structure dictates what that scale is. It's a, it's a G major scale, right? Now, if I move to an A minor, then I'm Carlos Santana, right? You know? So you definitely, you need harmonic context to practice the modes or you need, or you want to practice them all in the same position, you know, it's the same, like, you know, G Ionian, G, any, any thoughts on that guys? Yeah. Well, well if I might, one of the things you had mentioned before uh, was, was the idea of play, play deliberately. So you understand, or you can, you can predict what you're, the sound you're about to make before you make it. Right. And one of the important things I think is that you have to understand how, what you're doing in your, in, in your fingering pattern maps against the harmony. Right. So both what you said before and this particular bullet item that you're mentioning. Um, so practice with, with the harmony behind you right. to hear what's what's going on. Because really what ends up being important is for you to anticipate what's about what you're about to do. And and in like, you know, like Pat Metheny would say, you know, you go and you eventually get to the point where you, you listen to the line you're playing and you the next thing you play is the thing that you want to hear. Yeah, so let's let's yeah, it's a great point. Let's simplify that a little bit, you know. So I, I don't want to hit you guys with too much theory, but what you can do is if you want to venture into the modes, you don't have to take it all on at once. You could take the um let's take the Lydian scale. The Lydian scale is a major scale, and you can read on this and just 
pick a month and say, I'm going to learn how to play Lydian stuff. Okay. So the quality of the Lydian that's different than the major scale is it's got a raised four, meaning that the fourth note is up a half step. So that's the note that you want to play around. You want to play a major chord. I'm in G. So play a G chord, then play that. You want to play around what note in that scale gives it the quality of, you know, to make it a, um, to make it that mode. Uh, the Mixolydian, um, the fifth, has a um, has a flat five, right? That's where the uh, where dominant seventh chord comes from. So you want to stay around that um, that whole step from the seven to back to the root. That's that's really where you want to try to target your notes because if mm. you're playing all the other notes in the scale besides that note. It's just going to sound like the major scale. You're not going to hear any difference in the, uh, and just for the, you know, for the clip notes on it, the, um, the really the, um, the, the uh, what do you call it? Locrian scale is not a, not a great scale for certainly not to, to start with, but you can try the Dorian. Dorian is probably a, a good one to start with or the Lydian or the Mixolydian. Um, and they each have a unique quality to them. You know, find out what that is. We can do a video on that, but uh, yeah. Um, just take it, take it slowly and just literally, you don't need to know everything about the modes. You could literally say, I'm going to practice playing in, um, you know, play the one to a five, you know, play a G to a D or one to a four is even better. G to a C and then play your Dorian and try to, uh, your, um, your Lydian and try to focus around that, that note that, you know, is the different note. Try to make up little melodies, you know, two note melodies. All right. Yeah. So what are we on to, Simon? The next one. Uh, that was modal testic, by the way. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I got a I little th off of I think the um I think the thing the thing I always think about with the modes is if you've already learnt major scales or the pentatonics, just apply those modal extra notes to your pattern. That's a great point. So just take that one note, you know, you play your G major. Yeah. Um, so you want to, just one thing though, if you want to use the modes in that context, it's 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 going to sound better if you uh, if you use the Lydian Mixolydian over the major pentatonic and the, yes. a, and the uh, Dorian Aeolian over the minor pentatonic. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So that's the way I always think of them. Um, uh, but that's probably a bit over. Anyway, whatever. So... I am a big fan of having the guitar sitting out because it looks at me and goes, hey, play me like that. And I think uh, if you've got it in a case under your bed, it's pretty easy to forget. How does it, how does it go again? Hey, play me. Nice. I know it's amazing. It could talk like that. It's fantastic. Your, it sounds like your guitar might be not what non-binary. Oh, I don't know about that. That just reminded me, Rick, there for a second, of the original version of The Fly with Vincent Price. When he's pointing around, help me, help me. Help me, <laughs> yeah. help me. Yeah, something like that. Um, so that's the wonderful thing. Actually, somebody was talking about this guitar before. It actually has its own voice, which is something that Gibson did a few years ago. It was an excellent uh, innovation. All right, but for, I, for, a, for I, the Amazon gift card I've got, here's the trivia question for today. Oh. So those of us that grew up in the uh, were children of the 80s that, you know, finally got cable in like 84 and had TNT or TBS, I'm sorry. Um, we know Vincent Price from what? What is Vincent Price famous for to us? Not House of Wax, not uh, not The Fly, but, 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 see if anybody gets that one. Oh, uh, that's, that's, I know that. Is that, you know that one too? You don't even live in the U.S. Well, I think the reason he's famous to me is something else in the 80s he did. Okay. Well, this this was well. I mean, I kind of threw people for a loop here because he didn't actually do this in the eighties. He did it. Oh, in right. Okay. Seventies, but it was on reruns. See if ah. you figure that one out. Anyway, and we move on. And he is the man who can read the phone book and scare everybody. No, no, not no, not Thriller or Batman show. Maybe nobody knows this one. Maybe I'm I'm being too uh, I'm going too deep here. All right. So so I that's what I always think of Vincent Price for is when he does the thing in Thriller. So on that on that note about keeping the guitar in view, having it being close to you, I have this saying: always try to move the needle forward. So if you 
have the guitar right next to your bed and every day you pick it up and you just go, uh, you know, whatever, um, whether it's, um, you know, doing like little, you know, little, uh, paint, paint the neck type exercises or anything, even a, um, even just play a major scale, whatever your level is, it's going to definitely get you, um, going to move the needle forward a little bit right? rather than yeah. just, you know, and that's being intentional too, rather than, uh, just, you know, picking it up and, you know, oh, and just doing your, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. all right. So this is, so in this one, somebody's obviously going to have to just get into my head to get the answer. Right. So okay, I, I'll, know, I'll let you hold off on the answer there whilst I say one thing about the guitar. Lots of people freak out about having the guitar out in the room. You know, am I going to kill the guitar? If I hang it on the wall, am I going to kill the guitar? No, you are not going to kill the guitar. No. And take That's all the, the strings answer. off. Just take off the strings off at once. I've never met a, a guitar tech ever that said that anything was going to happen to your guitar if you took all your strings off. The only caveat I would add to that is if you have a, full, a fully floating bridge, right? Like if you have a 175 and it's being held down by tension, that yeah. you, have to, you have to anchor that before you do that. We don't, we don't have caveats in this, uh, in this program. Okay. No caveats. No, that, that is good. That is, or or if you have a very inexpensive twelve string, you you don't want to like leave all twelve strings off for you know for a few days. I'd I'd say that if you're gonna, I mean, I take them all off on every one of mine. But and and all that crap about you know keeping your twelve string tuned down to D. Every one of my twelve string guitars is in standard tuning. I've got like fifteen of them. They're all in standard pitch. Um, I don't have a humidifier. I don't have a dehumidifier. I just I I, I let it rip. And they all they all seem to work just fine. So yeah, so I've had all my guitars That's sitting cool. on the wall here uh, for I've been in this house now for twenty years. Um, I think as long as they're not in direct sunlight, you're probably going to be fine. It's pretty humid in Sydney throughout the year. I don't have a dehumidifier or anything like that. I have aircon in here, which is on now because it's about a million degrees outside. It's just. Like you'd be fine as long as I, I just I don't understand the whole because the tension the strings put on the neck is much greater than the sort of the hanging headstock thing that people talk about. Um, so, you know, guitar shops literally have them hanging on the wall, right? So I figured it's probably okay. People ask as me as long as they're secure properly. That's the thing I would say. So, you know, I've got solid brick walls in my house, but I know like in America, like you have a lot of that panel board stuff. Yeah, which, rock, so, yeah, yeah. So make sure you put it into one of the studs. Yeah. The anchors don't, eventually those anchors are going to give. So definitely try to put it into a stud. So a lot of people, one of the most common questions I get asked is, you know, how often do I set up my guitars? You know, a lot of stuff about setup. So my answer to that is UPS sets up my guitars. Okay. However, that guitar comes bouncing out of the case. When I open that box up, is exactly the way I like it. All right, how's that uh, for information? Yeah, I, uh, I I'm a fan of having my guitar set up. Uh, so I get the guitars set up every so often. So the last time I had this guitar set up was in 2016, for example. But as soon as it goes out of tune, and it won't stay in tune anymore, put new strings on it. That's nine out nine times out of ten the answer. Yeah, definitely. I put new strings on all the time. You definitely Simon, want to watch. Simon, you're doing. You, you you had another person do your setup. Mark, do you do do you do your own setups or do I, you have somebody else do it? I do all my own setups. So I'm big on intonation, and I'm big on uh, which I just move the saddle. I don't you know just whatever I can do. If it's an acoustic, then obviously you don't have a lot of um options. But um. But and then I change strings a lot. I don't really, as far as other, I mean, what else is there really for a setup action? You know, usually if your best bet, if you've got an electric is to, you know, is to sight your guitar down the neck and see if you've got too much relief. Um, but you've got a lot of options. So you get, you have the, you know, in this case, like this, this one, this one, I actually move up and down all the time because I use this for slide guitar. Um, oh. yeah, unfortunately to my, um, the people that live upstairs, my family, I play slide now, but, uh, the, um, so I raise the action and lower the action on this all the time. Now right. for acoustics, they're much more temperamental. I, I learned my lesson. I had a, um, a carbon, uh, AE 185, which has an acoustic bridge and, uh, even just changing it from nine, from tens to nines, the, the thing 
was never properly intonated. I had somebody make a compensated saddle for me. And it just, so I did, the, you know, I did the only thing that I could do to make it work. I'd send it to my brother. <laughs> so <he did. laughs> one of the great I, things is if you can go and get a hold of one of Dan Erlewine's books about doing, doing that kind of stuff, then that's a, a nice guide to have. So you have, you know, he pretty much sets steps through setups on each of the major brands. Of Put him in the comments, Gabe, uh, Dan Erlman. Dan Earl. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, the only thing I, I, so I'm a bit of a, I like different sounds and stuff on guitars. So, uh, I have changed pickups and I have, uh, have Les do that for me. Um, the only really major thing I've done is that when I bought this guitar, for example, it just wouldn't stay in tune, whatever I did. Cause you know, just, I don't know, it didn't. So I actually changed the type of bridge because, you know, really if this isn't moving, this isn't moving, it should, when you put it in tune, it should stay in tune, right? So that this is the one time where it was a guitar, a actual guitar issue. Of all the guitars I've ever owned, this is the only time it's ever happened. And I got something called a Tone Pros Bridge. So this kind of tunematic situation it's where you have approved. Gabe nodded. Yes, it's Gabe. Yes, yeah. I have that. I had. I did the same thing to my three thirty five. Yes. Yeah, so I've got. It basically has the poles, the standard poles that poke out the guitar, but it also has a screw that goes through the pole this way, right? So that it it can't move. Even like when we say move, the the bridge that came with the guitar originally, we discovered that actually it was moving like that much. On its but, own. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, like you'd bend and there was one time I went, it was a beautiful moment in a gig and I went for the bend and I'm pretty good with bends and I bent and it was like, Argh! and I was just like, what the? <laughs> if, the bridge, and, if the bridge moves enough, you, when you bend, it just, it just sounds like you're not bending, right? It just moves. It. Well, it was, it was a bad amount. It wasn't a good amount. Yeah, and, so, and if you're holding and doing it, you get the sag. So. Yeah. 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 It was terrible. So uh, that was, that was a. That was a fix, but that, I mean, so when we talk about setups and all that sort of stuff, I've got to say, like, I do kind of agree with Mark that often when it comes out of the box, it's pretty good nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the Tone Pros Bridge is an excellent, I did that myself. I mean, it has the anchor points, which, which yeah. helps, right? And it also has that, you know, that the reality of those saddles being held in place on the original bridge are held in place with a piece of wire. Yeah. Uh, and that's a problem. So, mm -hmm. so the, 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 uh, the Tone Pros version of the ABR bridge, that's decorative only. It's actually held in place. Uh, it's a, and I think that that's once again Dan Earlwine pushes that. Dan Earlwine, we got yep. everything. Um, we're gonna refer everything. I've never heard Dan of this Earlwine. guy. <laughs> I haven't either, but I've never know. heard of this guy. But now I'm gonna go and look him up afterwards. Definitely, Dan. Er okay, so uh, where is seven? Structured learning. Consider a well-organized guitar course yeah, or sure. curriculum. Absolutely. Structured learning helps you progress efficiently. It's less like anything. If you haven't got a plan you're not going to get anywhere, right? So I always say when you are doing your practice, split it into three bits. Your first bit is you do your warm up and it can, that can be different things. It can be like Mark said, this kind of painting the fretboard thing before, or it can be, you know, that kind of thing. Do that for 20 or maybe 15% of the time that you're going to practice. And then for 60% of the time, do the thing that you're learning today, whatever it is. And then for being a good student and doing your warm ups and doing the practice of the thing that you're doing, then you get to play whatever you like. If you do this in the other order, you play whatever you like, you will never ever do the warm up and you will be less likely to succeed at the thing you're trying to learn. Yeah, so, so, so a couple of points there. So one of the things I'm actually have a video coming out soon on warm up exercises and it's, I'm gonna title it something about why warm ups are so important. And the reason a, a really good warm up, a warm up that actually addresses a couple things is important is not because you're going to, I mean, I guess if you're older or you have some issues, you, I mean, I've never sprained my hand because, oh, you know, I started playing instead of warming up, you know, oh my God, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so maybe I'm just lucky with that. But the reason is because at least half the time when I come down to practice, um, you know, I'm, I'm two minutes into my warm up and 
I get called to do something else. So that two minutes might be the only two minutes I get today. So I want to make sure when I jump into it, if you have a good warm up, you know, like I said, I love doing these exercises. These, uh, I call it painting the neck. I can, I can copy it on the, uh, I'll send it to anybody if you want to email me, but basically you can start from, if you take four frets, if you apply one finger to each fret. So five, six, seven, eight, and you can start from anywhere. You can start up here. See, I, I start there and I end there, or you could start here. Right, or you can start there yeah. that way, or you can start here. But each time you're just you're moving along in kind of a diagonal direction. It's really good for picking accuracy. One of the biggest issues I see with beginners and early intermediates is picking accuracy, just picking the wrong string. You know, you're playing a whatever it is you're playing, you know, you're playing day tripper and you know, you know, hitting the wrong string. So yeah. you wanna you wanna get used to and this is great for aligning. You wanna take your time though. It's also yeah. better, probably better practice without amplification because it doesn't sound that great. But uh, although it is like that, what's it? Um, the Sugarloaf, right? Isn't there? Uh, yeah. Green Eyed Lady's got some riff like that in there, doesn't it? Green Eyed Lady. Yeah. yeah. Remember that? You know, Green. Anybody know? Nobody knows. I don't you know, know what that is. So it's green. You know, Green Eyed Lady. Green Eyed Lady, Ocean Lady, oh. Child of Nature. It's a '70s song. Friends. Oh, and- I was only born in the '70s, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah, right. I don't know. I've never heard it. I'm going to look it up. There's something else to look up. Simon, are we the, are we the old man to you? There it is. No, I, I, I just, I just, I've never heard that before. Wait, hold on. Bump, 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 ba da da, bump, bump, green eyes. I can't believe you don't know that one. No, I never, never heard of that. Anyway, so one of the really good tips for for people that are coming back that have a, um, you know, you have a relationship with the guitar that's sometimes you play, you know, every day for a couple months, then you go away from it, you come back again, or you just feel like you're not connected with it. A really good thing to do is to is to go back and relearn a riff that you already know, but really learn it this time. So if it's something like, um, you know, like Layla, you know, just really try to get that. Whatever the riff is, however difficult, or, you know, even Iron Man, you know, it's not the easiest riff, you know, the, this little, practice that, you know, just whatever the riff is, or if you're a little better, you know, and something like that, you know, you could practice getting those little bends in there, right? Yeah. That sounds good. That kind of thing. So just try to really get like a really good one is uh, Purple Haze because there's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot, you know, everything from the slide down to the that little bendy does there is like perfect, right? He doesn't do yeah. like, he doesn't do pick harmonics like I do, but it's just it's yeah, it's good. He's just, he wasn't that good. That guy. He was good, but George Harrison is the best guitar player of all time. Oh, I he is. I mean, he just is not even not even close. Uh, so. And finally, all right. And the last one is co- commit. Oh, I thought I thought it said commit something else. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal if you don't play. Wow! I was going to say, you, can you make it do the scroll? I'm really enjoying the scroll. Yeah, it's I got it. it takes, give me a second here. Hold on. All right. So now I got it here. There we go. Ah. Boom. Yeah, this is really important too. Or one video. I, yeah, I just think it's uh, tempting to try and learn. 18,000 things at the same time. Um, and then you learn, end up learning everything to 60% of its completion. A really good course is Fender Play. I'm going to give this a plug. I've got no affiliation with them, but I, I give it, anybody that wants to learn online, they're, very, they're little bite-sized lessons. They're like eight to 10 minutes a piece. Um, they go from level, they have five different levels and it takes you through beginner, beginner, you know, never picked up a guitar before to early intermediate level five is, but they ask you at the beginning a series of questions and they, and you start playing songs right away. I mean, I think the the very first lesson, you know, you know, just you're learning stuff, you know, if you pick classic rock, if you pick, um, 
if you don't pick, you know, if you pick a country, I don't know what you learn. I think you learn some Jerry Reed. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, right. so that, that kind Reed of thing, just to have, yeah, so just to have a thing that you're going to have a go at and just stick on that. Um, I, I, with students, I generally have people sort of learning maybe two or three different things at the same time, because I think a little bit of variety definitely helps because you get a bit sick of things. But you can come back to it and then you'll see the progress if you have a bit of rest for something then you come back to it but learning 10 things at the same time no thanks yeah and that's one of the issues with just using youtube videos now if you're going to use if you want to just go free and you want to use youtube videos go with something like justin right justin guitar or, or andy those guys have them all i think they've got them categorized because the problem with just yeah. like going to uh various youtube videos is there's no context, right? You, you're learning, you're excited to learn this, this new technique, but how are you going to apply it? You know, where does the video go? Cause most of the time the videos are made just to really teach you that one thing and they don't really have context to the next one. So you're going to end up wasting yeah. a lot of time learning a lot of unconnected things. You know, you always want to ask, you know, what am I learning this for? What's the point of learning this? You know, it's actually not quite, long. that's quite interesting because like, so I teach, I do loads of lesson song videos. And the ones where I have, okay, the reason we're doing this and this and this is because of this and this, you know, I get people that get you know, annoyed. That was close. They get annoyed with, um, you know, learning their technique. They're like, oh, I don't care about that. I just want to learn the thing. It's like, yeah, but you're kind of missing the, anyway, whatever. Yeah. So Robin Ford, I have a video on this about uh, practicing and Robin Ford said, um, you know, anything that you're playing, on the guitar is a musical thing. So the, the number one worst habit that we all have, and it's hard, very hard to get out of is we're always playing something to get to the next thing. We don't even know a lot of times what it is, right? You know, you're learning something. You're like, well, I, I know this part of, you know, you know, I don't know this part. So I just got to get to that now. Right. And Robin Ford says, whatever you're playing is the thing. If you always make what you're playing, the thing, you'll be a lot more successful with it than, then, you know, trying to get to the next thing, right? You're always rushing through the first half to get to the second half because you know the first half better. Well, you end up rushing through that and then you play everything sloppy. Mm. Um, you know, imperfect practice makes for imperfect playing, right? I mean, you just, you want to slow it down and you want to try to, whatever you're playing, you know, make that, even if you pick the guitar up and just go, you know, even without vibrato, just practice uh, your um, dynamics. Yep. Um, yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's anything like that. There's, there's a lot of. Um, I mean, there are so many things to practice. Yeah, there are plenty of things. And, and there are really, really plenty of things to practice. So I would, in, even with that sort of thing, you know, have a week where you practice that dynamic thing, and have a week where you practice trying to press as lightly as you can. Here's another shame. It's like the day of the shameless plugs today. I am sorry about this. Um, I have just put a course up. Oh, nice. I didn't know that. Oh, no, I did. I'm going to, it's available at a new thing called Melodious, which of course is an app. Melodious. Uh, um, I just put a link in the comments okay. here. And so I've got two courses up. I've got one for people who literally have never played the guitar before. And I have one for people who want to play sexy notes. Sexy in, notes. Sexy notes in blues solos. So a bit like what you were doing before, Mark. So instead of your, you know, you know, doing the kind of situation. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that is a course from literally how you sit with the guitar, making sure your posture is correct, make sure your hand is correct, make sure you're the right part of your hand, how you use the pick, what the notes are called, like literally an absolute beginner's thing um it's like a collection of six or seven seven or eight minute videos with a whole bunch of course content and all that sort of stuff available with it so, so when I, have a look at that yeah definitely check out simon's course definitely that's a, I'm, I'm definitely gonna check it out when i was at nam i made a big wave with my hand and i said you see this all of this exists because we're all too lazy to practice Right, that's what NAM is. NAM is a collection of people that don't want to practice, right? It's, it's by buying another guitar, 
I don't have to practice. If I if I if I look up this, I do that. Yeah. The laziness. I I think I like the new guitar. I like the new guitar. Yes, there is a cost, Jerry. He's still playing. That, that's the that's the Sugarloaf riff. I figured it out while you were. All right, good, excellent. Um, uh, I think the gear stuff is hard because new gear is good. It's fun, yeah. And it's fun, and it does inspire you to keep going, right? So, but I, you know, if you're buying a new guitar every six minutes, then probably that's too many. But uh, you know, new bit of something every so often is cool. Here, I got a little little thing I got to put up here. Um, where is it? Um, there we go. How do I get to the end here? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I have too many guitars, said nobody ever. I actually <laughs> have that. I have that T-shirt. Is there a shirt? Yeah, there's a shirt. I yeah, thought yeah. so. I thought I got that. My, uh, my friend Claire bought me that shirt a few years ago. I know. Somebody at the end said, shots fired. I know. I'm, I'm cynical like that. I, I think that when people say to me, what do you think of this guitar? I say, go practice. <laughs> Should I buy? Go practice. Right. Ask Cole. I right. Don't I always say that? Cole's one of my students. I I would say that I'm a I'm a massive uh, enabler of the buying of the stuff. I get excited. I can't help it. I was thinking of doing a video. I'll I'll give it away here. The um the video is th this. Ninety nine percent of guitar players agree this this is the one guitar that all guitarists must have. And it starts off. You hand them a Les Paul. And they're like Les Paul. Nope. Stratocaster. Nope. Telecaster? Nope. The next one. The next one. Like the next one. That's the, um, that's it's the, good. right? The next one. All right. Well, I did, I, historically, I had loads of guitars and I have pared them down. So like I had like five Telecasters and I pared them down. And I bought one good one, stuff like that. So. Do you know from 1983 when I started playing until 2018, I owned a total in my life of 12 guitars. This is including basses, guitars, classical, electric, acoustic, 12. And I never owned more than five at one time in my uh, entire life. I, I had five yeah. guitars in 2018, and now I have 43. <laughs> <laughs> you do not. I have 43 guitars. Oh, Mark, that's too many. You need to sort that out. You Didn't you just say? I don't even have any room. I don't have room. I, they're everywhere. Hey, I, hey Mark. Go practice. I practice all the time. I, the funny thing is, when I go to sell one, I'm like, I played that one today. I literally, I, I played like, I played like an hour on six different guitars today. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Forty three. Now, when you want to talk about when you when you bought too many guitars, I, I show you now the too many guitars. This oh. is this is a Jamstick Studio, so this is a MIDI guitar. Oh, that's cool. Oh, right? that is too many guitars. So it's for right? you. So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's this, I mean, the, the, this is probably the fastest tracking MIDI guitar I've ever played. The fastest wow. tracking? What does that mean? It can keep so up that, with what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, uh, I mean, no latency? Yeah. So, so, you know, the big difference between, you know, this is digital, so it's slow. You know, it's not a, it's not a GR from Roland where it's a, an analog synthesizer. This is a legit MIDI controller. Right, but this is something that I bought, and it rarely comes out of the bag. So that's the too many guitars. Yeah, I like that. I would. I wouldn't even know how to plug that thing in, man. <laughs> there's two. Uh, so there's. Do they still use MIDI? Do they do they use they use USB for everything right now? Right? They don't so, use MIDI anymore. So, old MIDI things, do they? Uh, they do. This is USB. This is MIDI over USB. So. That's um, nine. You know, so down here. I don't know if you can see, but down here is the no. USB-C. Uh, oh. Then you get up here. This is just uh, an audio. Um, wow. But it's um, it also does Bluetooth. Of course so it does. You know what I mean? It's like ridiculous. <laughs> but um, uh, it's, it's – you have to – you know, it's about what soft synths you've been investing in, right? So if you have, you know, good soft synths in your, in your machine and you're going to go and say, oh, I'm going to play a Korg Triton and I'm just going to use <laughs> this to control it. Right, but it's still the tracking isn't perfect. Yeah, um, I bought that's, that's my, cool though. I, I, I'd be keen on having a go with one of those I, things, I but it's just beyond got, my. I got this. Oh, oh, very nice. The Universal Audio. This is the. Um, it's one of those modeling mics that um, is. It's. It's basically you can use it as a as a seven seven MB or B seven. Oh yes, yeah, right. Um, you could like 
you can record stuff that sounds like Thriller. That's the big deal about the 7B, right? And I can't, what is it? The Sure 7MB? Yeah, it's the yeah. one that all those podcasters use. I ordered yeah. this, by the way, there's a, there's a certain microphone. I can't remember the name of the company. I, I, I gave it away. But there's a, there's a guy that's a really good YouTuber that I, I respect. He a, does a lot of Beatles stuff. You guys will probably know who I'm talking about. And he promotes this, this guy that's supposed to make these, these handmade microphones in New York that sound just like Neumann U87s. And they're like $150. If you ever happen upon that, um, that video, do not buy that microphone. It is a piece of shit. Can I say that? I think I can. It's it, but it I really was is. so good before. I know, I know, but it really, it's it's. So I had a buddy of mine open it up and look at the transformer. He's like, it's, it's complete junk. It's probably cost ten dollars to make this microphone. And everybody's like, people bought it and they're like, people don't know what they're listening to. They bought it, they're like, oh my god, I can't believe the way my guitars sound. You know, it's like what we're using before, like a you know a Radio Shack mic. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was. I mean, I tried to like it. I played, you know, even the. The 2020, the Audio Technic 2020 is like I bought it used for 50 bucks. Sounds 10 times better than that. The other microphone that's way overrated, and I love Rode. I've got like five Rode mics, but the uh, the NT1A, crap. It's another one that people love to um, to say is good. It's just harsh sounding. You can buy a lot of mics that are like you buy one of those MXLs for $99. Use a, use a 58 or 57. They all sound better than that mic. But Rode makes great mics. The NTK is one of my personal favorites. This is this is a Rode mic. There you go. Brought to you by Australians. Um, okay. So what do you use in terms of when you're micing? When you're actually doing a mic to go in, you know, voice, distorted amp, clean amp. Right? I use I use the NTK, the Rode NTK, which is a tube mic for everything. Okay. So so I mean, in this, you hear fifty seven. Yeah, fifty seven is what people put in front of Marshalls, right? So, in front of anything. Yeah, but I mean, but then I always saw that people were always using really expensive condenser mics in front of their fenders. Yeah. Bradley, no, I, I have played a Guild 12 string before. Um, you know, I like Guild. No, I played a lot of Guilds. I was thinking Gretsch for some reason. There's something about Gretsch guitars that they're just big. They're not all big. I mean, I, I'm sure they make smaller guitars, but the ones I played are always really big and they're, they're just, the neck is really fat on them. And I've just never had a really good experience with Gretsch guitars, but yeah, guilds are great, but I got them. Um, oh, Bradley, hold, hold tight for a second, Bradley. Let me show you something here. We're going to go in a second. Simon, I promise. Bradley's got to see That's my right, guitar. Man. Uh, I got, uh, so somebody yeah, needs to learn something by the angels. Fill the gap guys. Fill the gap. <laughs> okay. I'm filling the gap. So somebody down here said, uh, I need to learn a song by the angels. Mate, I have got you covered. I have, uh, this is like Simon promo day. I don't know what got into me. Maybe it was that coffee. Something went down the wrong way or something. I'm not great with that. But here's a good uh, lesson on take a long line. I quite like take a long line. And um, the bands take a long line. Take a long line off a short pier? No. <laughs> no, it's a bit like that though. It's cool. They, the angels are great. Uh, I'm a big fan. What? Did you, oh, you've got another new guitar. Oh, is this one we saw the last time? Is it? Uh, I don't know if you can hear it. I'll just play uh, play it with the picks for now. It sounds great. This is a uh, this is mm. the uh, this is the uh, Taylor um, five sixty two. It does sound good. Sounds great. Yeah, this is a it's a great it's a really good playing guitar. I always take the third string and uh, I I turn the third string. I I flop them around. I use a I I don't first of all I don't like the um, unless you're playing with a thumb pick. In which case, it's real. You have to have a standard um, stringing, like a, not a standard, but a like a Rick stringing, because you're not going to get that. Right, you're not going to get a good good pick on that because you're getting that that octave note. But if you're like me now and you kind of drop mostly, I've been using my thumb mostly now because I grew the nail out. Um, you can get uh, you when you're playing. If you play traditional, I'm losing my train of thought here. You're playing traditional finger style. You're you're using your your ring finger or your your ring finger. Yeah, I wear my rings on my pointer finger. Uh, you're using your index finger for the um, for the third string. So that's an upstroke. 
So you want to have that, you want to be able to attack that, uh, that high string first. Everybody understand that? That's a very interesting analysis. So yeah, you want to, I mean, that's what I do. And really people say, oh, the, you know, the nut, da, 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 da. I mean, it's not a big deal. The nut is there. I mean, literally the nut is like a tiny little bit bigger and they flip around and they work fine. So it's not a big deal. And if anybody, all these people that have all these things that these catastrophic things happen to their 12 strings, like you got to send them to me because everybody's like, oh, you got to tune down a full step or it's going to like collapse, you know, like it's going to take it, your house with it. <laughs> you know, uh, I've never had anything happen to any of my guitars, including the Van Goas. I've got like six Van Goas sitting around. Um, they're all they're all tuned up to to standard. I'm gonna actually I'm gonna tune some of them up to like G sharp. I'm gonna put them up like four hat like and see what happens. I bet you those bridges will just stay on there. I'll probably lose an eye from one of the strings. But <laughs> Paul Reed Smith claims to build Paul. Let me tell you something about Paul Reed Smith before we go. True story. Paul Reed Smith in front of Victor Wooten, Tyler Lawson, and a couple other very well-known uh, musicians. He insisted that there was only a suspended four. There was no such thing as a suspended two chord. How do you get to like, how do you get that far and not know? Like, I mean, he's a good guitar player and not know that there's a sus two. He was arguing with them on stage. He's like, what are you talking about, sus two? There's a, it's a, a sus chord is a four chord. No, the sus two, you know. All right, there you go. Anyway, that's interesting because you know I, you want to know what if, if for all those people out there that are now interested in sus two chords, go and watch any documentary on Frank Zappa you can find, and when Ruth Underwood shows up, she will show you suspended two chords. Frank Zappa likes suspended two chords. She used to write the music for her. He used to go and he he would never write sus, sus two. He would just write the the root and two. Without the sus two, you can't play. Uh... Everybody, listen to me and return me. Ninety percent of Rush you can't play without a sus two chord, right? And um, uh, this is, here's a good one. Guitars out of tune. Uh, oh, purple rain, purple rain. You need so I've got a bit of a theory about some of those chords. Like sus two, it just sounds like the eighties to me. Lots of chorus, right? Yeah, loads of chorus. It's just like the it's like the eighties. So I've got this theory around certain chords coming in and out of fashion. And I made about it, a video about it once and I was like, this is going to be the greatest video in the history of the world. And about four people watched it. But I still think it's a great idea. So, that's, like, such a, that's such a great scale degree. I mean, I mean, when you think yeah. of the police, I mean, Andy Summers uses yeah. it. He does, he does full blown nice chords, he does add yeah, nights, exactly. and he does seconds. Yes. Yeah, that's right, all the time. Don't dream it's over, correct. Oh, so yeah, the Brady Bunch was the answer to my question. So Vincent Price was on that. Remember the three-parter where they go to Hawaii? And uh, Vincent Price was in the third one. He's in the cave, remember? They have, they have, they have to return the idol. That's that's. Um, remember the idol? So anybody that's seen that, so somebody can redeem themselves on this. Can you think of one of the catastrophic things, one of the bad luck things that happens to them on the idol? There were three things that happened, one to Mike, or I think one to each one of them. So do you guys remember what any of the um, the bad luck that they have? I'll give you a hint. One of them was one of them was. Remember, Peter had the uh, the uh, picture came down Seven and almost killed him. And then Greg wiped out. You guys are losing them. You have one more. Nope. People don't know it. They don't know. So the other one was. Um, remember the tarantula. There was the tarantula that was crawling on the bed. It was going to get Mike. And then what? What was Marsha's? I know Jan had like the something in her skirt, right? Had something in her hula skirt. Didn't something happen with somebody losing the architectural plans from the father? Was that that episode? That might have been. I don't know. Oh, cousin Oliver. You know what that is, right? That was jumping the shark. Yeah. Cousin Oliver was it was the um, was the end of the Brady Bunch. <clears throat> you guys know where Jump the Shark comes from? It comes from that episode of Happy Days. Happy Days, yeah. There's, I finally knew something about American television you and didn't that, ask me. And, and that was Happy Days Visiting Hollywood, right? 
So he jumps a shark down in Santa Monica. Yes. He, 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 um, wait, in, in his leather jacket. Yep. So we, have, we used to argue, like, who the main character of shows are. Now, some of them are obvious, right? But, you know, but uh, there's a couple of shows that are tough, ensemble cast. Like, like, in my opinion, every show has a main character. Friends has a main character, even though it's an ensemble cast. And, um, and, and, and what we were arguing, somebody was trying to argue that Fonzie was the main character in Happy Days. And that's just silly. I mean, obviously, Richie. Richie's the main character. Yeah. Yeah. But here's a good one. Here's a good. One. Now this is now we're getting into you know into books because I'm rereading Lord of the Rings for the fifth time. Oh. Who is who is the true hero in Lord of the Rings? Frodo, right? Classically, it's Sam. Oh, Sam Gamgee. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. He's the only one who puts the ring on and refuses it and takes it off of his own free will. Nice, Jerry got it right. All right, Jer Jerry, you win this week. <laughs> Jerry's um, the winner. Jerry's the winner. Email me, Jerry. Um, who's, best so, uh, is who's the main the character? Answer. Anybody? Give me. The who's answer. the main character in Friends? Ross. For sure. I'm sorry, I just ruined it for everybody. Go ahead, do another. Yeah, one. Ross. No, that's right, one? Ross. Yeah, absolutely. David Schwimmer is the main is the main uh, main character in that oh. show. There you go. Uh, so I'm gonna go and have a day. You guys. Have, you've got to go to bed soon, right? So, you know, happy days. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching. If you've enjoyed today, please don't forget to hit that like button. That was pretty good, wasn't it? When we were formatted, we had like 15 people. When we started just talking about shit, I mean, uh, stuff, um, we got, when we start picking up more people, maybe we should just keep this open from now on. Just... I think we need to sort of ask people to hit the like button and then... It just goes like that's, that. that's what I do on my on when I do my premieres. Like I keep asking people hit the like hit that button. like button. Hit that, that it, like it, button. It really doesn't make much of a difference. Like like Tino's uh, movies and stuff. I just do it. I I try to find like little fun things to do. Just to whatever. I mean, it's not like like somebody else hitting the like button is really going to make that much of a difference on um yeah. channel. All right. Um, all right. I think that's it. That's definitely it. So hopefully that was helpful for everybody. Just in summary. We spoke about a bunch of different things. Be patient with yourself. Choose a decent, well-adjusted guitar. Select songs suited to your own ability. Build a habit with five minutes of daily practice. Get a guitar stand so the guitar talks to you in that funny voice. Cut to the chase, you know, just practice what you need to practice and have a structure to your learning and really just follow one path. You know, don't have 17 things that you're learning all at the same time. That is how you stay focused and motivated for the guitar. What's that? What's that, what's that chord? <laughs> so, look at him. Well, stay so focused there. I'm so focused. Playing so many chords. Awesome gas. I'm just trying to think of that chord that, you know. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Is it D? Yeah, that's a D, yeah. There it is. All right. Thank you very okay. much, everybody. Everybody be safe. Take care. And I'm going to try to get a new video out sometime this weekend. So ah. keep an eye out for that. And if I don't, I'll put some shorts out. I'll put some, some more shorts out. Uh, and yeah. somebody asked about angel stuff. Uh, next weekend, I actually have an angel's lesson coming out on Love Takes Care. Oh, I thought you were angel by, um, by, by uh, Hendrix. No, no, no. We're talking about Australian stuff, mate. Australian. Uh, see you guys later. So somebody Thanks asked for me, watching. I'm going to try to learn Cliffs of Dover on the 12 string. Ouch. But not, not, at, not, at, uh, not at this tempo. No, no. I just like it. Like, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, I don't know. Like maybe. That's not for me. 12%. That's not. 12%. Oh, last thing before we go. So we saw Eric Johnson in concert. Now, Gabe likes Eric Johnson. So I was losing my mind. I went with a friend of mine who's not a big music fan. Uh, my partner in, in the, the Rock Lock. So Eric Johnson, literally the entire concert has his back turned to the audience. I swear to God, you only go to Eric Johnson to see him play, right? He's looking back at the drummer like this. So you, you, you stare at his back the entire thing. Yeah, he, he has that habit. And it's I've ridiculous. Seen him. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. And he also, he, also gets, he also comes into the center of the stage. He comes to the center of the stage and turns around and looks at the drummer. Yeah. And it's just, and he's not, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's almost like he's in his living room playing. It's just the way he is. And it's like Michael Stipe back in like 82, but Michael yeah. Stipe learned how to turn around and become a band leader, right? Yeah, All right. but it was just, you know, that that's something he does. You know, uh, people have commented on it. And everybody at this point, if you're a long-term fan of his, you just say this is sort of his 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 own sort of anxiety thing when he gets on stage. And, you know, 
you know, and he's he's a pleasant enough guy. I mean, the guy will stop a oh, show. Definitely a nice guy. But uh, but anyway, <laughs> I gotta if I ever that's my goal to get big enough for my channel to get big enough where I can actually interview him just just so I can let him know that he's got to like turn around. All right, <laughs> we are out. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Please be safe. Ciao. Good night. Good night.